Over 12 million men, women, and children passed this way. Passed through rooms and corridors haunted with a special stillness which remains only in places once noisy with human life. Here they bought tickets for a thousand places in America. Here they traded their drachmas, their liras, and their ruples for dollars. Here they sang their first American songs, experienced their first American Christmas and Hanukkah. Here they waited to be given permission to pass over to the new land. Tens of millions of us have relatives who came this way. Sat in this room, part of the largest human migration in history. Of the many who came, some were turned away. But even they would leave part of themselves in America to remind us why they had come so far why they had made the journey. You never know how hard it was to leave her. That was the hardest thing I ever had to do. She said, if you leave, why, I don't ever want you to come back again. Long, hard life. <laughs> what? Europe had always lost its children to America. And now there were new reasons to leave. Industrial change and political unrest had brought increased joblessness and poverty to Italy and southern Europe. And reaching as far north as the industrial cities of Poland and Russia. In America, they were saying, there was a future, perhaps a fortune to be made. In the southern European ports of Naples, Piraeus, Trieste, in Constantinople, they gathered to board the ships to America. Some were birds of passage, leaving to seek work and return. Others with hopes to find at the end of the journey the good permanent life that awaited, they were told, 3,000 miles across the sea. In the rural areas of Eastern Europe, they had in addition to poverty, other reasons to look to America. The government was taking young boys to the army. In a mother's lifetime, she might not see him again. And always there was the police, the historic persecutor of the Armenian, Slovak, and Jew. You know what I see now? I see the peasant with a wagon and hay to take me, take me away. The whole town was around my wagon. Everybody came to say goodbye. But I didn't know how to say goodbye. Poland, Russia, Romania. And everybody just wanted to get out of there. Making their way to the railheads, they sought passage to the sea. Some had money for the journey, and some did not. But turning back was seldom an alternative. 
I didn't pay no tickets. Get out and train in, in pray for luck. They cared us just like you would care move a bunch of pigs. If you're gonna move a bunch of calves, a bunch of pigs, would you put them in a passenger car? That's the way they looked at us. For many, entering the great port cities of Northern Europe was like entering a new world. They had reached the sea, and the immigrant was now in the hands of the steamship company. Immigrants from the east and north swarmed into Bremen, Antwerp, Hamburg, and Liverpool to be processed for the passage to America. They stood in line together, those who saw America as an adventure, those who saw America as a beacon of hope. It was a business of numbers, an operation designed to house, feed, and process 4,000 people at a time, to identify those whom American authorities might reject and return to Europe at steamship expense. First thing they do with you is delouse you. Look your hair all over. Your hair, if there was a net in your hair, they would you would have to have a shampoo. During epidemics, huge facilities were established to fumigate clothing, baggage, and people. Processed and ticketed, they waited for their ship. They boarded in many parts of Europe and in many kinds of vessels, most to New York and some to other ports. But they had one thing in common. They were traveling steerage, and the steamship companies understood the profit in numbers. They began a journey that could last from a week to a month. That was the last time it ever ran again. That was the last trip she made. She should have never made that one either. For some, it would be a voyage without incident. For others, the crossing would provide days for which they were ill-prepared. They gave us a tin plate with a fork and a spoon, a cup of soup, and that much bread, 15 days. It was all going to be home. I was in the cellar. There was little lights going on there all the time. Little lights. We were riding in the steerage, like animals. You could see a lot of water, but we didn't see the sky. No sky. To escape the throbbing engines and the odor of spoiled food, those with blankets came on deck for air. She was sick all the time. People didn't know where the toilets were, and so they had used it. It was a terrible life. I prayed one night that that ship would go down. It was so horrible. It had to stop for a while for some, you know, the waves was washing. 
concentrated to go down. There's only one thing in my mind. Well, I wanted to get out of there and to come to America. It appeared like in a fog, and everybody ran over to the railing and just admiring. I thought I was, I thought I was in heaven. My God, this is this a city on earth or this is a city in heaven? Never seen a building like that, but beautiful. I have to cry. Everybody was just waiting to get off that, standing waiting to get off that ship. You were just wondering where you were coming to or what was going to happen to you, you know, in your mind. Still separated from the first class and cabin passengers who were processed by immigration officials on board, the immigrant from steerage waited yet another boat ride. This one from the Hudson River Pier to an island in the upper bay. Crowded into barges and ferries, they approached the place that had become a legend in their mind. as bad as it was. It was good to see any kind of land. According to the houses I left in my town, this was like, like a whole city. And I almost felt smaller than I am. When I came through these doors and saw all these people there, I figured, well, I guess I'll have to stay here for good probably, but see, all these people, what are, they, what are they doing here? And nobody was happy. You don't know what's going to happen. a dress and a pair of shoes. <laughs> That's it. One suitcase I had with me. And about about fifty dollars, I guess. My basket. My little basket, that's all I had with me. You were lucky to have the one. We had no other possessions but that. We had no baggage. We, we had nothing. Nothing except the clothes. We had nothing. Clinging to their possessions, they entered the great building and climbed the stairs. Jesus and Mary and Joseph, I says, where am I? They would come right into the big hall, and there they were told to sit and stay there. 
staff and it's in this and they didn't know where they were it was a new land but they haven't been in land it was just a big hall and all you could get was tears and crying of the children for the vast majority the process would last less than a day but now they waited those from Europe and the Near East with those who had arrived from the Caribbean those who were the first in their family to come to America were those who would be met those who came to make money in return with those who were determined never to return. So they all had this fear, this worry. They were worried about police because they were always checked in the other countries. The word government frightened me. Government was tyranny. Government was officers who, who looked at you with a sense that they wanted to hate you or eliminate you. And the idea that there is democracy or that the policemen will help you was very new to me. The policeman, uh, to me, was uh, someone who could cut my head off. It was the most dangerous thing for everybody to go through it. The ice. Trachoma, the dreaded disease of the immigrant, the diagnosis for which could lead to almost certain deportation. If there's anything that put a chalk mark here, chalk mark there. Those identified to be set aside for possible rejection represented a small percentage examined each day. But this was little consolation to a family separated. You didn't have to know the people, but you know that somebody's missing. The agony they went through. So you know that somebody's missing in the family. All of a sudden, the thought, my goodness, they're separating us. Because that's what the police uh, always did. They separated the men from the women and then took care of the women and children. As long as some member of the family, some loving member of the family was with you, life was tolerable. Uh, you lived in a relationship of family love. Even though the other members of the family, you didn't know where they were, you could converse, you could plan, you could warm each other. I had a feeling that I'm left all alone. It's a terrible feeling. All of a sudden, they were gone. America did not want the burden of an unhealthy immigrant. America wanted a person who could make a living and was not bringing into the country an infectious disease. And they looked your back over and your lungs and your heart and your everything. And you were sent from one to the other, one doctor to the other. And a lot of people were put away on the side. I wouldn't want to be sent back. People were rejected because they showed outward signs of illness, what they considered mental difficulties. We didn't call it psychiatry, they called it neurology. And we said, we're sorry. And the ship that brought them had to take them back. That was a, a tragedy. I decided if, if they ever, ever have to send me back, I'll jump down to the water and never go back to Russia. 
I never want to see it again. Built for 1,500. The dining room often fed 3,000. There would be dishes and forks and knives and white napkin. Long tables, well set, but when the people went in, it was like, like chaos. And they handed us food. Uh, food was uh, not something people gave you. I didn't like it, but then I tasted it again. But I never had seen a banana before. To me, this white bread was like cake already. At night, Ella served as a dormitory for thousands, waiting the new day. Each morning, the great hall would fill, and the noise would begin again. Hopefully, their papers were in order, a clean bill of health, a letter from a relative guaranteeing they would not become a public charge, proof that they were not a contract laborer or a dangerous alien. In adjacent rooms, the detained were given additional scrutiny and an opportunity to make their case. But accepting an appeal to Washington, the Board of Inquiry was the rejected immigrant's last chance. Through an interpreter, they did their best to persuade him to overcome the complexities of a changing immigration law. But it was in the Great Hall where the vast majority faced their first and their last test. In his hand, the man at the registry desk held the ship's manifest. In his power, the right to interpret questions intended to identify those who should be let in or kept out. They know a word of English. I couldn't understand English, not one word. First question, how much money have you got? She had to have five pounds. My father, I remember, gave me that five pounds. Do you know how long? It took a couple of years, two and three years, to get that $25. My mother, when we got nearer, and the person at the desk called our names, my mother turned to me, she says, I was never here, how does she know my name? I said, it's all right, no. she knows it. They asked for my name, and I told them Licht, and they say, how do you spell it? Well, I didn't know how to spell it, and they didn't know it, and they spelled it L-I-C-H-T. I said, it's all right for me, I don't know the difference. But then they said, all right, you can go. You're free to go. To Hoboken. Yeah. There would still be questions of what food to buy for the railroad trip to Chicago and the boat trip to Boston. There was still the strange names, the strange numbers, and the fear of losing one's money. It was the process of buying a ticket to places with unpronounceable names like Pittsburgh, Hamtramck, and Keokuk. But those were details. The island had passed them through. The door to America had opened. It was as if uh, God's great promise had been fulfilled. I'm going into a free land. I don't think I ever can explain that feeling that I had that time. There isn't such a thing to be explained. It came out of my uh, system. It's over. 
not my native land, but it, it means more to me than, than my native land. It means more to me than my native land. Any country on earth that you can, you, this never happened. And become a human being again. It's a miracle. I'm glad I'm here. Couldn't be any better, could it? And everybody had hopes. And one thing I was sure, and thousands like me, that the degradation, the abuse, and the privation that we had in Europe, we wouldn't have here. Oh, God, yes. Hoping for centuries. For 